Uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to come and give a, a talk uh, in this seminar on the, uh, the major contemporary um, environmental issues. And as uh, David kindly reminded us, I'm a philosopher, so I will give you the point of view of a philosopher about uh, what I have called uh, in this title, which is a bit complicated or even a bit cryptic, uh, the, coupling, the coupling between social and ecological systems, theoretical and practical issues. Uh, what I want to, to do uh, is um, to question the theoretical and practical issues uh, related to the concepts that uh, have been coined uh, in order to uh, uh, try to couple uh, between social and to, to couple social and ecological system. So, in fact, uh, to be totally transparent, uh, I, I was asked to talk about ecosystem services and nature-based solution. And I, I will do so, and <laughs> I will keep my commitment, but uh, I will also try to place these notions um, in the theoretical and conceptual framework, philosophical framework in which they were developed. Um, the ontological and anthropological uh, assumption on which they are based uh, in order to propose a critical analysis of ecosystem services approaches and nature-based solution approaches. Um, I will basically proceed in three steps uh, in my uh, presentation by first examining the question of why the coupling, the coupling between uh, ecological and social system is important. Um, what does it imply? Uh, uh, and then I will address the question of theoretical means. Uh, uh, how do we couple these systems? What methodology and what concepts? And it is on this occasion uh, that I will address the concept of ecosystem services, nature-based solution, and another one, uh, a more recent concept, the concept of uh, nature's contribution to people. Uh, the idea will be to define them, quite rapidly to characterize the way uh, in which uh, they make it possible to answer uh, the, this question of uh, uh, coupling uh, ecological and social uh, systems. And um, then above all to give uh, an account of the debates that they have provoked uh, uh, some huge debates, uh, notably uh, in the case of uh, ecosystem services. Um, of the criticism uh, that have been addressed to them and finally in the third part uh, uh, based on this criticism I will describe uh, proposals that defend the need to strongly reorient uh, approaches aimed at thinking about the intent dependencies between humans and young humans or between humans and nature uh, and to, to rethink this, these interdependencies away from the now well-established uh, path of the ecosystem service, services approach. So, uh, I start by looking at this question, why it is important to look at uh, ways of coupling social and ecological system. So, well, the first reason is that uh, this is an intention that is not self-evident in the history of thought, particularly in the history of Western thought. Uh, one can even say that a very strong tendency aiming at doing exactly the opposite has uh, uh, been going on in Western thought since antiquity uh, and that it was considerably reinforced during the scientific and philosophical modernity. Uh, this tendency aimed at detach, detaching, at separating uh, what belongs to the, to the social and the human world from what belongs to nature and its law, at precisely uh, decoupling the social system from the ecological system. Uh, it is basically 
the theme of the tearing away from nature, which would characterize uh, humans, uh, the later would thus evolve in a social reality, which would be like superimposed uh, in some way on the natural uh, reality. So, if you, we can recall uh, a, a few major sources at the origin of this way of thinking about the separation between humans and nature. Uh, first, we can think uh, of what the American historian uh, Lynn White Jr. Uh, put forward in a 1967 article entitled "The Origin of the the Sources: uh, The Origin of the Environmental Crisis." It was uh, the real title. Uh, in this very controversial paper, uh, Lynn White questioned Christianity. Uh, which he considered to be one of the main sources of the establishment of a relationship of domination between human and nature. Uh, from a reading of Genesis, uh, considered very highly uh, questionable by many other thinkers, but uh, the, the historian could affirm that Christianity was the most anthropocentric religion in the world. Um, I uh, quote Lynn White Jr. And when he say that God planned all of this explicitly for man's benefit and rule, no item in the physical creation had any purpose save to serve man's purpose, purposes. And although man's body is made of clay, he is not simply part of nature, he is made in God's image, in God's image. And he goes on and at the just uh, after that quote, he said, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religi religion in the, the world as seen. Ending by Christianity uh, established, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it's God's will that man exploit nature for his proper hands. A second major intellectual source of this point of view is located at the turn of the 16th and 17th century, which saw the advent of scientific and philosophical modernity. It is in particular uh, in the precept forged by Francis Bacon in the Novum Organum, a work aiming to lay the foundation of modern experimental science that the relationship of domination to nature crystallizes. The domination becomes, in a way, the finality of the scientific investigation, Bacon uh, states in the Novum Organum. But if one were to endeavor the, to renew and enlarge the power and empire of mankind in general over the universe, such ambition is both more sound and more noble than the other two. Many philosophers working uh, on environmental issues see in this statement of Bacon the focus where a problematic relationship to nature is forged and permanently established. We must also mention Descartes, who is presented as the great architect of the dualism separating consciousness and matter, human subject and the rest of things. The French philosopher is known in environmental thought for being the one who theorized the reduction of nature to matter, uh, which would have somehow disenchanted nature. Uh, I quote, take it then first that by nature here, I do not mean some deity or other sort of imaginary power. Rather, I use the word to signify matter itself. And he, at the end of this uh, short, uh, text, he introduces the notion of laws of nature, the rule by which these changes that occur in, in nature take place, I call the laws of nature. So Cartesian rationalism would mark the break with paganism or forms of animism that admitted the existence of spirits in nature. And then let us finally quote Kant to, Kant to complete this very partial picture of modern thinkers. Kant, whose moral philosophy expressed probably better than anyone else the separation between humans, who are moral subjects, and the rest of the beings uh, in the world who are assimilated to things. Uh, 
only the former are endowed with an intrinsic value, that is, C recognize the fact that they count as ends and not simply as means. In the metaf metaphysics of morals, Kant established that every human being has a legitimate claim to respect from his fellow human beings and is in turn bound to respect every other. Humanity itself is a dignity, for a human being cannot be used merely as a means by any human beings, but must always be used at the same time as an end. It is just in this that his dignity consists, by which he raises himself above all other beings in the world that are not human beings and yet can be used, and so over all things. So the beings of nature, on the other hand, are reduced to the state of things and can therefore be used at mere means. This great theoretical framework of modernity, uh, which it should be noted does not account for the diversity of modern thinkers and must be understood as a deep intellectual trend, uh, was synthesized by the French philosopher and uh, sociologist of science, uh, Bruno Latour, in his book, in his famous book, We Have, been, we have Never Been Modern, published in 1991, uh, Latour paints a broad picture of a modernity that is structured around two major divides. The first is the one that separa separates nature from society within Western thought uh, itself. And the second is the one that establishes a separation between Western culture and the other one, uh, Western culture and the other one, the other one culture are defined as pre-modern culture because they do not yet separate nature from society. So you see that if we believe Latour and many other, one of the characteristic features of Western thought and in particular of modern thought is to want to separate society from nature, to get human out of their natural dependencies. Modernity would be uh, animated by a great Promethean dream aiming by the development of the techniques to be sheltered from the contingencies of nature. However, this ambition, which has been the subject of many criticisms since the 18th century, seemed definitively untenable at the beginning of the second half of the 20th century, when the theme of the environmental crisis gained invisibility and power. I will not go into the details of the birth of this environmentalism in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. I think you've already heard uh, about it, and I, I simply recall Rachel Carson's 1962 book uh, Silent Spring and the, rep the report, The Limit to Growth, um, because they are uh, almost the, the two most important publications uh, uh, regarding um, to the uh, birth of this environmentalism in the 1960s and 70s. Um, I just give you a short excerpt from the former which addresses this issue of the dependence of human, life, human lives on nature. And uh, it's a, a, an excerpt from Silent Spring. For each of us, as for the robin in Michigan or the salmon in the Miramichi, this is a problem of ecology, of interrelationship, of interdependence. We poison the caddis flies in a stream and the salmon run dwindle and die. We poison the gnat in the, in the lake and the poison travels from link to link of the food chain and soon the birds of the lake margin, margin become its victims. These are matter of records, observable, part of the visible world around us. They reflect the web of life of de or death that scientists know as ecology. As for the Meadow Report, you know those curves that introduced the idea that the infinite 
pursuit of economic growth in a world with finite natural resources is unsustainable. In other words, Meadows and his colleague used this curve to represent the dependence of human societies on nature. A few, uh, a few years later, several years later, uh, the notion of planetary boundaries, well, the notion, renewed the approach to the situation of interdependence between human and nature, and this one insisting from now on on the risks incurred by humanity if they leave a safe operating space uh, characterized by condition of habitability of the planet, uh, of the planet favorable to the development of human societies. And we note, uh, as you know, that several of these limits uh, have already been crossed. I insist on, on this uh, notion of interdependence because it's important for understanding contemporary debates on the coupling between the social and ecological systems. Interdependence is undoubtedly the great mis message uh, of the ecology of the 1960s and 1970s. It is, for example, what is put forward in Barry Commoner's book, The Closing Cycle, and its uh, four so-called laws of ecology, uh, the first of which is everything is connected to everything else. Uh, this thought of interdependence is the opposite of the modern ambition to detach ourselves from nature. On the contrary, ecology invites us to understand that we cannot detach ourselves from nature, that we are strongly dependent on a large number of natural processes that we cannot control and whose disappearance would be catastrophic for humanity. In terms of thought, of environmental thought and environmental ethics, the notion of interdependence is also at the heart of the re renewal that environmental ethics wish to embody, to embody. Following the great precursor that Aldo Leopold was, uh, we must think of ethics or morality not as something that raises above other creatures, but as a guide that allows us to better cohabit with all beings belonging to the same biotic community. In uh, San Conti Almanac, the most famous book uh, of Leopold, the uh, environmentalist writes, uh, writing the, um, pointing out the importance of Darwin uh, uh, in, this, in this story, it is a century now since Darwin gave us the first glimpse of the origin of species. We know now what was unknown to all the preceding caravan of generation, that men are only fellow voyagers with other creatures in the odyssey of evolution. This new knowledge should have given us by this time a sense of kinship with fellow creature, a wish to live and let live, a sense of wonder over the magnitude and duration of the biotic enterprise. Book of 1949. Thus, the whole uh, field of environmental philosophy that emerged at the end of the uh, 60s and beginning of the, uh, of the 70s underst undertook to reflect on what had been too neglected by modern moral philosophy, namely the relation between humans and nature, or new humans and non-human living beings or living environments. This is what the Australian philosopher, uh, one of the first uh, environmental philosophers, uh, Richard Rutley, indicates here in a founding article published in the main review, in main journal of the, of the discipline, Environmental Ethics, he wrote in 1973, it is increasingly said that civilization, Western civilization at least, stands in need of a new ethic and derivatively a new, of a new economics, setting out people's relation to the natural environments. In Leopold's world, an ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. 
It is not, of course, that old and prevailing ethics do not deal with man's relation to nature. They do. And on the prevailing view, man is free to deal with nature as he please. That is, his relation with nature, insofar at least as they do not affect others, are not subject to moral censure. And that's precisely the point environmental ethics wants to change. Finally, we must also mention the important work of the anthropologist Philip Descola on Western ontology and naturalism, uh, the questioning of the universality of the naturalism, the questioning um, of the dualistic representation of the world radically separating humans from nature, constituted an important step on the way to taking into account the fact that human societies are always embedded in a system of relationship with non-human. And Philippe Descola pointed out in his famous book Beyond Nature and Culture that the modern West way of representing nature is by no means widely shared. In many regions of the planet, humans and non-humans are not conceived as developing in incommunicable worlds or according to quite separate principles. The environment is not regarded objectively as an autonomous sphere. So, for nearly 60, year, 60 years now, Ecological thinking has been inviting us to rethink the relationship between humans and nature and has been highlighting the dependence of societies on nature, which part of modern thinking has tried to make invisible. And in so doing, they affirm that it is vain to want to study and understand human societies without asking the question of the relation that sees maintain with nature, with nature, with the environment, with all the non-humans. And they affirm, in other words, that there is no autonomy of the social in relation to nature. However, far from having disappeared, the Promethean dream of decoupling is still very much alive. It continues to inhabit the advocates of economic growth that would allow the decoupling of the increase in human well-being from the increase in the consumption of natural resources. In the same way, dualism continues to underlie economic or political model based on assumption of strong substituability, which see in technological development the possibility of making the society increasingly autonomous from its material base. These, ideal, these ideas are strongly promoted today by various current of thought, including the ecomodernist current, which is a current of thought that brings together researchers and experts working on environmental issues and had the ambition to renew environmentalism. The thesis of decoupling is indeed their main argument in favor of the continued development of economic growth and technological development. In their manifesto, the Ecomodernist Manifesto, they write, decoupling of human welfare from environmental impacts will require a sustained commitment to technological progress and the continuing evolution of social, economic and political institutions alongside those changes. And they also write uh, uh, in, this, in the same uh, manifesto, plentiful access to modern energy is an essential prerequisite for human development and for decoupling development from nature. So uh, I therefore wanted to, to emphasize uh, uh, at the end of this first part, the fact that despite the relative rise in power of environmentalist discourse and environmental thinking, the thesis that in order to study and understand human societies, social and ecological systems must be brought together in a single approach 
is still not self-evident. And consequently, we must keep in mind that programs seeking to develop integrative approaches, if they are flow and we will talk flows and we, we will talk about them, have this great merit of trying to counter the ideology of decoupling. So I know uh, I now come to the ways of trying to apprehend social and ecological system together or reconnecting these systems and therefore of breaking with a way of doing uh, things that consist of separating the study of human system from the study of ecosystem. In other words, uh, to break with a partition uh, that saw ecology studying the ecosystems and the human and social sciences studying human societies. It is therefore a question of thinking about the links between human activities and ecological processes within the same system, a kind of uh, social ecological system. This can be schematized in different ways, but we often find this kind of figure indicating two interacting subsystems, and that is precisely in order to study these interactions that theoretical tools, theoretical categories are needed and this is precisely where ecosystem services appear. The idea of ecosystem services assert that the human species in a stakeholder are, the human species is a stakeholder in a network of interdependencies between species and between species and the physical environment. It invites the quantification of resources and of the different contribution provided by an ecosystem to humans. To, to further define rapidly this, this notion, we can refer to the synthesis uh, proposed in the report of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, which was carried out between 2001 and 2005 to assess the consequences of ecosystem change for human well-being and to establish the scientific ba basis for action needed to enhance the conservation and sustainable use of ecosystems and their contribution to human well-being. And then uh, in, the, in the report, we find a series of fairly clear definitions uh, for that of an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a dynamic complex of plant, animal and microorganism community and the non-living environment interacting as a functional unit. And then the definition of ecosystem services, which are the benefits people obtain from ecosystem. These include four famous categories of ecosystem services, provisioning services such as food, water, timber and fiber, regulating services that affect climate, fluid, disease, waste, and water quality, cultural services that provide recreational, aesthetic, and spiritual benefits, and finally, supporting services such as soil formation, photosynthesis, and nutrient cycling. So, we, you, you've probably uh, already seen that kind of figure representing the eco, um, eco, um, ecosystem services approach. Uh, and you can uh, find on that figure the four category of ecosystem services uh, and they are uh, usually uh, defined like that. Uh, supporting services are the ecological processes that underlie all ecosystem uh, and therefore all other ecosystem services. Um, you have provisioning uh, uh, services refer to components of ecosystem that are used as resources by humans. Regulating services, which are processes that determine the quality of our environments. And finally, the cultural services refer to the aesthetic, moral, uh, spiritual, and psychological impact that ecosystem have on humans. A few dates uh, uh, about the rise of this approach, of the ecosystem service approaches. Um, the notion was introduced by researchers in the 80s, uh, and it has gradually gained acceptance in the world of nature protection and 
nature management, management. It is mentioned in the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, but we, we, can, we could probably say that the first major study to introduce the concept into the public arena was uh, that carried out by Costanza and his colleagues, who in 1997 uh, published an article in which they proposed to quantify the total value of the services provided by all the planet's ecosystems. And the uh, value was uh, around 33 trillion per year, dollar, trillion dollar per year. Uh, then the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Initiative commissioned by the United Nations Environment, Environment Program, um, which I have already mentioned, uh, contribute, contributed greatly to the development of the approach. Uh, we should also mention the TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystem and Biodiversity Program, supported by the European Commission, European Commission, uh, which has also integrated the ecosystem services approach into its, bio, its biodiversity strategy. Finally, the notion is initially at the heart of the creation in 2012 of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBS. Thus, also, it's far from being hegemonic uh, from the point of view of economic approaches in general. The notion has become dominant in the world of nature management and nature conservation. Its promoters um, point out uh, several assets of this approach, of the ecosystem service approach. First, um, they think that it responds well to the need to highlight the critical role uh, ecosystem and bio biodiversity play uh, in sustaining life, human well-being and long-term economic sustainability. Then it appears to them as a conceptual tool with the capacity to make environmental externalities explicit and a basis for the design of policy mechanism intended to internalize the value of such externalities in market transaction and decision-making processes. And fina finally, in terms of research, it promotes the dialogue between academic discipline and improved communication between interest group as different as farmer, economist, policymaker, and entrepreneur. At the same time, the theoretical framework within which ecosystem services are situated and the practical implication of their use raises many questions, raise many questions. This will give rise to a long and lively debate that is still ongoing. In this figure, you can see a certain number of these questions, which are at once epistemological political and ethical. There are the following ones. For which purpose is the concept used? Who bears the costs? Who benefits? What constitutes well-being? How can we measure and or monetize benefits? Who decides? And what is included, what is excluded of this approach? A vast literature has been built, to, built up to try to answer this question. And I'm not going to go into the details of uh, this literature, but rather uh, to put forward uh, some salient points uh, of this uh, literature. The ecosystem services approach has been strongly criticized for its blind spot and for the risks it, pose, it poses to nature conservation. In France, uh, among many other works, we can cite the book by the philosopher Virginie Maris, Nature Avant, Les Limites des Services Écosystémiques, Nature for Sale, The Limits of Ecosystem Services, uh, 
and a more recent book by the economist Ellen Torjman, um, La Croissance Verte contre la Nature. In general, the main criticisms are as follows. Ecosystem services adopt a utilitarian perspective and tends to reduce the value of nature to its instrumental values. Then, ecosystem services situate the protection of nature and biodiversity into an explicit economic framework, which is orthodox neoclassical economy. Ecosystem services encourage the commodification of nature and the transformation of all possible environmental values into a single unit of exchange or a single metric. So they privilege quantifiable services over qualitative relational aspects. And last but not least, for that reason, ecosystem services could be a Trojan horse for monetization of nature. These uh, five critiques, criticism are uh, probably the strongest, uh, the stronger, strongest one that have been addressed to ecosystem services approach. So the difficulties uh, encountered by the approach, both in terms of the theoretical criticism we have just seen and the difficulties in operationalizing it gave right to new concepts in nature protection policies. First of all, the concept of nature-based solution. Could we reframe the approach with nature-based solution as it is proposed uh, on that figure from the IUCN uh, framework of nature-based solution. This idea of nature-based solution is introduced uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the 2000s by the World Bank and IUCN to highlight the importance of biodiversity conservation for climate change mitigation and adaptation. It is the subject of the following definition for the IUCN the nature-based solution are the potential power of nature and the solution it can provide to global challenge in fields such as climate change, food, security, social and economic development. And for the European Commission, the nature-based solution harness the power and sophistication of nature to turn environmental, social, and economic challenges into innovation opportunities. And we, 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 can also, we could also mention that uh, the approach is adopted by the, the European Commission for its research program Horizon 2012. So, do nature-based solution really represent a paradigm, a paradigm shift? In reality, far from marking a real reorientation with respect to the ecosystem services approach, nature-based solutions seem to have been conceived mainly with a view to operationalization. And the word solution, nature-based solution, in the context of global change. It is a question of multiplying the means of implementing programs based on resources and services provided by ecosystems. So the notion uh, does raise much the same fears from the point of view of the economic and political model in which it seems to have to fit as the one raised by ecosystem services approach. Another proposal has, has more recently emerged in the context of the IPBS works, that of nature's contribution to people. Again, with the aim of analyzing the interdependence between social and ecological system, this new approach intends this time to respond more explicitly uh, to some of the criticism addressed to ecosystem services. And a few words uh, of definition uh, about nature's contribution to people. It is introduced by IPBS in 2000, 
2014, but really developed uh, in a 2018 report with the aim of overcoming uh, some important limitation of the ecosystem services approach from the point of view of potential exclusion of certain stakeholders, exclusion of certain worldviews or knowledge systems. It therefore aims to develop a more inclusive theoretical framework for human nature relationships. The main changes are in the vocabulary, for sure, replacing service by contribution as well, as, but as well as the, in the willingness to take cultural aspect and the diversity of knowledge more seriously. So, uh, nature's contribution to, to people uh, clearly uh, intends to uh, be more inclusive about the diversity of knowledge systems. And some authors have recently tried to highlight uh, the main contribution of the NCP framework to the ecosystem services framework. And this is what is represented on, on this uh, figure uh, on the slide. We uh, should uh, uh, identify the way uh, uh, NCP framework um, is, uh, is more inclusive than uh, ecosystem services uh, uh, approach. And you can see that uh, the context-specific perspective, the diversity of worldview, but also the issue of relational values are highlighted uh, on the figure. At the same time, um, while some emphasize the changes brought about by this new theoretical framework, others tend to question the fact that it embodies a real novelty. In this sense, Muradian and Gomez Bagethun speak of the Fauna syndrome, of the Fawn syndrome, sorry. They write in a recent article, um, I quote, it seemed then that the development of the approach was caught by the contradictions derived from the need to reconcile two opposing goals to show continuity with the IS fr framework, to, with the ES framework, ecosystem services framework, on the one hand, and to break with it in order to establish a new discourse on the other. And we therefore argue that the NCP approach suffers from what could be called the Fawn syndrome. syndrome. The faun, a creature from Roman mythology, is a man with some goat's features. Despite the animal appearance, it nevertheless remains human in essence. Instead of internally consistent alternative, the NCP approach looks as a hybrid whose features are not enough to set the basis for a new way of conceiving human nature relations. From this point of view, Again, the NCP would not really embody a paradigm sh shift, but rather a simple name change. This multiplication of concepts that claim to renew the approach without transforming the general theoretical framework also raises question among researchers and managers. Should we continue to invent new concepts to, comp to compensate for the inadequacies of previous ones? Or should we rather take stock of the action carried out according to this general framework and perhaps radically change them? From this point of view, the testimony of researcher Aiden Washington, a uh, researcher, an, an ecologist, and a uh, specialist of environmental issues, Aiden Washington, published in a recent article with an evocative title. Uh, the title of um, his paper is Ecosystem Services, A Key Step Forward, or Anthropocentrism's Trojan horse in conservation. 
in 2012. So um, the, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, paper, um, uh, Aiden Washington asked, uh, uh, what should we do about ecosystem services approaches? Um, and uh, he, he looks back on 20 years of development of the ecosystem approach and questions the progress made. He, he began uh, his paper by these words, the last 20 years have seen enormous discussion of natural capital and ecosystem services. Yet, despite this, the environmental crisis has worsened as have prospect for the long-term conservation of nature. It may be that through ecosystem services, some decision makers are now, are now more aware that society is completely dependent on nature. And thus, some decision may have been better than they might otherwise, otherwise have been. But we should ask, how ecosystem services and natural capital in its commodified sense relate to eco-justice. One can only conclude not well. All the stakeholders for natural capital and ecosystem service, services are human stakeholders and the benefit come only to humans. Do ecosystem services relate any better to social justice. At first glance, their focus on benefits to humans and the, the accompanying argument that we need nature to provide ecosystem services may suggest this. However, the fact that ecosystem services ignore benefits to nature means that over time, biodiversity will continue to decline with consequent impacts on society, especially the poor. The benefit of ecosystem services to social justice are thus questionable. Similarly, ecosystem services do not help reconcile the two justices, social and ecological justice, as both natural capital and ecosystem services were born out of an anthropocentric worldview. And Washington had, perhaps it is time to consider that if the worldview and ethics that define ecosystem services were flawed, the term itself, itself may be also. If the anthropocentric and utilitarian ethics of neoclassical economics are flawed, then maybe the idea of assigning shadow prices is indeed part of commodifying nature, and hence, it too is flawed. And the last part uh, of the text, Washington tape remember, reminds us that the point of this chapter was to consider whether ecosystem services will help conservation in the future, as well as whether they would help to reconcile social justice and eco-justice. And he states that ecosystem services remain a conflicted term and certainly cannot be considered one that foreground ecocentrism and eco-justice. It may, it may well be one more Trojan horse of anthropocentrism within the cons conservation community. Though, his conclusion is quite tough for ecosystem services approach. So, given that kind of uh, testimony from uh, an ecologist, a researcher, should we not radically review the way we think to understand the interdependence between humans and nature? And consequently, return to the basic assumption that accompanied the development of ecosystem services, of nature-based solution, and finally of nature's contribution to people. That's 
the point I propose to examine in my last uh, part, uh, last part of, of, of this presentation, on all the possible ways of thinking about human nature relations. It seems necessary uh, to revise the theoretical framework in which these approaches are situated since it does not ultimately meet the expectation expressed by the environmentalist critique that appeared, criticism that appeared in the 1960s and that I described at the beginning of my presentation. And there are several reasons for this. First, this framework remains rooted in dualism and despite the efforts made by IPBS, struggles to take into account the diversity of knowledge system and the diversity of culture. Diversity of epistemologies, the diversity of ontologies. It also remained strongly anthropocentric, like uh, as uh, Washington uh, highlight, uh, has highlighted in, the, in his text, emphasizing mainly what is useful for humans in nature, it has thus been repeatedly stressed that uh, these approaches fail to take into account uh, the intrinsic value of nature, the intrinsic value of nature. But what I think is particularly important to emphasize here is a point that is not sufficiently understood um, in the thinking of the environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. It is the fact that environmental ethics carry a radical critique of the anthropology of neoclassical economics and that there is consequently a paradox in wanting to translate its message into the categories of the this, this same neoclassical economics. Environmental ethics are not simply ethics that emphasize the intrinsic value of nature. They also reflect on how we uh, envision ourselves, how, of how we represent ourselves. Uh, they reflect on who we are as dependent human beings, attached to other humans and non-humans, far from the image of the rational agents of economists. And that point uh, has, has been very well uh, uh, described by the economist Clive Spash uh, in his work and in particular in one of his, his um, uh, article uh, with uh, the ironic title, uh, How much is that ecosystem in the window, the one with the biodiverse trail. Um, in, in this uh, 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 paper, which is a, tr a tribute to the work of a philosopher specializing in environmental issues, Alan Holland, uh, Spash returns to the initial choice that guided much of the ecosystem services approach, which was uh, to defend the idea that Rezoning must be based on the anthropology of the rational idiots who acts only uh, in the name of the money he can earn. And he, he writes in this, uh, in this paper, quoting uh, Costanza and then uh, Holland, I do not agree that more progress will be made by appealing to people's heart rather than their wallets. That's a quote from Robert Costanza. And uh, Spash uh, writes, so an implicit model of human motivation underlies the money argument for conservation. That is psychological egoism. That is the claim that people are incapable of regarding as important anything other than their own interests. And that's uh, a quote from Alan Holland. And for Spash, uh, what is really important 
is that this anthropological assumption then determines how we think about the formation of value judgment that can guide public policy and public policy about uh, environment. He, he right? That judgment is required, is not per se a problem. It's not a problem that we need uh, to um, endorse value, uh, to values in, in, in our work and in, in, the, in the framing of public policy. The problem is how judgment is concealed and used to frame public policy. The approach to ecosystem services valuation encapsulates an implicit model of both human behavior and the relevant decision process for addressing environmental problems. The standard justification for this are embedded in support for or acceptance of the dominance of market systems. This ignores the many, way, many ways in which humans operate outside such system and without being psychological egoists whose only concern is their wallet. So, if we really want to reorient, to transform the approach to the interdependence between humans and nature, we may have to return to the criticism made by some environmental philosopher, at least, since the 1970s. From this point of view, the work of Karen Merchant, which is, uh, who is uh, um, an historian and philosopher, uh, is particularly interesting. Uh, and in particular, uh, her book, a 1992 book, uh, Radical Ecology, The Search for a Livable World, in this book, uh, Merchant starts from a general reflection on ethics to propose a typology of moral theories based on the type of good they seek to promote. And referring to Aristotle, she writes, in his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle noted that all knowledge and every pursuit aims at some good. But whether this is an individual, social, or environmental good lies at the basis of many real-world ethical dilemma. Egocentric, homocentric, and ecocentric ethics often underlie the political positions of various interest groups engaged in struggle over land and natural resource uses. These ethics are the culmination of sets of associated political, religious, and ethical trends developing in Western culture since the 17th century. So, Caroline Merchant argue that environmental issue can be approached ethically in many different ways, depending on whether one adopts a theory centered on the self, on the society, on the cosmos, or on the ecological community. And based on these criteria, she thus proposes a mapping of the different author and currents of thought. So I, I, I'm not going to, to comment uh, on the wall uh, figure, uh, uh, but the aim is rather to point out uh, the paradox that I mentioned earlier. The paradox which consists in wanting to think about the profound, the deep reorganization of our way of life, of our modes of production and consumption, which the recognition of uh, our interdependence with nature calls for, within the theoretical framework of egocentrism. egocentrism the one on the left on, of the table. As uh, described by Merchant, we can define this egocentric ethic as grounded in the self, uh, 
uh, and it is based on an individual ought, focused on individual good, and in its applied form, it involves the claim that what is good for the individual will benefit society. The individual good is thus prior to the social good, which follows from it as a necessary consequence. And uh, um, about uh, this uh, egocentric ethic, uh, Karen Merchants add that historically, the egocentric ethic rose to dominance in Western culture during the 17th century uh, as the classic ethic of liberalism and laissez-faire capitalism. In America, in America, it has been the guiding ethic of private entrepreneurs and corporations whose primary goal is the maximization of profit from the development of natural resources." End of quote. On the opposite side of the figure, you find the ecocentric and eco-community approaches. As non-anthropocentric ethics, they are defined by their defense of the idea that nature as a whole and all form of life uh, have a moral value that must be taken into account. Animal, plants, uh, but also ecological walls or communities have a moral value and count for themselves, that is not simply for the utility they have for, they have for humans, but in reality, and what I want you to insist on, uh, non-anthropocentric ethics contain more than the acknowledgement of the intrinsic, the intrinsic value of nature. They address issues like uh, the one Caroline mentioned, Carolyn Merchant puts uh, on the column uh, under partnership and multicultural, uh, issue like the complexity of nature culture relation, the responsibility to women, minorities, and non human nature, issues of justice, environmental, and eco justice. And these issues are at the core of the development of environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. Not only the question of the intrinsic, intrinsic value of nature. So, environmental ethics and non-anthropocentric environmental ethics can also be described as ways of thinking about the relational nature of human beings on an ontological level. What does that mean? Well, the, the classical representation of moral agent in egocentric theories describes relationship between individual considered as social, isolated, and independent atoms. Ecocentrism is in stark contrast to this atomicist conception of moral beings and instead defends a relational conception of the self and a relational conception of the moral agents. In this sense, uh, another environmental philosopher, John Baird Calicott, um, uh, who you can uh, see in the, in the table of Carolyn Merchant, in the same column, uh, Calicott writes, what is a moral being? A moral being is not a ghost in a machine, not an ego enclosed in a bag of skin, not a calculating and therefore driven preference satisfying social atone. As prefigured by Carol Gilligan, to be a moral being is to be a unique node in or nexus of a multidimensional web of relationships. And from this point of view, one can ask oneself, what is the sense of wanting to reintegrate this thesis, this environmentalist thesis, and critical positioning into the theoretical framework of egocentrism? 
for, as we have seen, to a large extent, the, ecosystems, the ecosystem services approach can be seen as seeking to make room for the concern of environmental ethics, the concern of environmental philosophy within the existing frameworks of egocentrism or moral utilitarianism when uh, these approaches are willing to, to integrate uh, uh, some issue of social justice. Uh, but the, the true question is this one. What, what, what is the sense of wanting to reintegrate this, this thesis, this positioning, into the, the first uh, theoretical framework? In its uh, 2019 report, uh, the IPBAs state that goals for conserving and sustainably using nature and achieving sustainability cannot be met by current trajectories. And goals for 2030 and beyond may only be achieved through transformative changes. Transformative changes across economic, social, political and technological factors. And, it's a, a strong uh, assessment. And uh, in, the, in the same re report, um, transformative changes are uh, defined as a fundamental system-wide reorganization across uh, a technological, economic, and social factor, including paradigms, paradigms goals, and values. So, what we might suggest in light of uh, Karen Merchant's analysis is that these changes will not come from a right to left uh, movement on the figure. Uh, no, no references to, to political parties here, but uh, this change will not come uh, from a right to left movement, but more surely from a left to right movement on the figure. So if we want to represent transformative changes in, on this figure, it will probably the one that could lead us from the left to the right, from the self-egocentric framework to the ecocentric framework. And I think that's what uh, many studies about ecological uh, ecosystem services approach have shown that ecosystem services approach is still stuck with the categories of self-egocentric framework. So I think if we really want some transformative changes, we have to explore uh, the literature uh, that exists in environmental philosophy that uh, try to clarify uh, what is a real ecocentric position. And I thank you for your attention.